I think we're live. Are we live? All right, live for the first time in, I can't remember how long. It's been at least a month, right? All right, let's see, insert ads during break. No, thank you, I don't wanna do that. Um, get notifications from YouTube. Um, Let's say I got a new setup at the moment and a new computer. Thanks to many of you wonderful, wonderful people. Thank you so much. It's been a while since I made videos because my computer died on me. Um, and so many of you came to the woodworks. He helps with donations, with purchases. So thank you very much. I've got a brand new computer. Uh, same case, a couple of pieces I was able to salvage, but new motherboard, new RAM, new processor, and it runs like a dream. So thank you. Um, let's see, is there anyone on the stream at the moment? Because I don't know if you can hear. Okay, yeah, so it looks like you can hear me. Good. So I'm just checking all, all of my things. All right, awesome. So um, this is just kind of the first stream I've done in a while. So we've got a couple of questions I was asked on YouTube and on Instagram to kind of clarify. And I've got three of them prepped, three that we'll go through. And then if anyone shows up, anyone has any questions, feel free to throw them in the comments as usual. But the first question was about choosing instruments. How do you find the right instrument for a part to play when you're orchestrating a new piece that you've written? And not only how do you find new the right instrument to uh, play a part, but how do you find the right instruments to double and different things? So for example, Let's say that we're just gonna write a quick little melody here, shall we? Let's turn this off. Let's go play. Okay, that's terrible. Um, let's try something. Let's. I'm terrible at improvising. Let's do. Let's do a quick little step, shall we? So we got G. Kind of like that idea. In fact, let's do this in quarter notes. I probably should have prepped something like this, shouldn't I? All right. All right, we don't need a full melody. Let's just say this is the idea that we have. All right, we got a simple little idea right here. And you're trying to think, all right, which instrument is the best choice to play this part? Let's bring up some notes. All right, so let's see here. Picking the right instruments while orchestrating. All right, zoom in a little bit. So the first step you're trying to, when you're trying to figure out what instruments work, you wanna focus first on just one primary instrument. So start by focusing on a primary instrument. All right, if you want to double, if you wanna work with multiple instruments, that's fine, that's great, you can do that eventually, but you really need to find one instrument first that's gonna be the primary sound here. And to do this, there's actually a couple just short steps that we can do, right? The first part is look at the range of the part you've written. All right, so here, this little ditty that I came up with starts with the G below middle C and Cubase C3 is middle C, as opposed to C4, which is normally middle C. Uh, so we've got the G below middle C all the way to the G an octave higher. So we've got a full ball an octave. It's a decent range, about standard for most melodic ideas. Um, once you've found the range, you want to start taking some time to think about what instruments can physically play this. Make a list of instruments that can physically play this part. All right. So G below middle C to the G above middle C. Violin can play that. Let's just make a quick list. Shall we? Violin. French horn can do that. Trombone. Euphonium. Um, let's get some woodwinds, shall we? Uh, clarinet could play that. Uh, cello could play it. Uh, we could do viola could definitely play it. That's a decent list. You can keep going for as long as you want. Come up with as extensive of a list as you'd like. The more options you have, the more choices you can make. Um, but you want to go through and figure out just what instruments can physically play this part. And that will take a little bit of study. You'll have to figure out you have to learn about different instruments. If you are studying instrumentation, I recommend you focus on three things. Uh, the instrument range, its registers, and its tone colors within those registers. Because the next step, after you've created a list of all the instruments that can physically play the part, is you need to take some time and think of what, think of what personality or what emotion 
do you want to convey with your music? I cannot type today. So this is going to be where we start to work on kind of like a process of elimination. All right. If you want to get a specific emotion, let's say you want to create something robust, something a little heroic. All right. So we can know if we want something robust and heroic. Violins probably aren't the best choice in this range, all right? That's the G below middle C is the lowest note that a violin can conventionally play. And sure, that comes for a lot of kind of cool emotional timbres and sounds that it can create, but it's not going to, you know, it's not going to fit that kind of bill for something robust and heroic. Um, French horn. French horn could definitely do this. In fact, approximately from the G here to the C up here, that's the French horns about their middle register, right? This is where the instrument is most expressive. It's the most powerful. Um, it's the most kind of heroic sounding, the most controllable. French horn could probably do it. Uh, euphonium is a little too mellow in my opinion. And viola and cello and clarinet aren't really good options. From my own personal opinion, this is where yeah, your own opinion comes into the figure where you kind of have to decide. Um, what do you want? What do you like? And a lot of this comes from listening to music. What instruments What instruments do you tend to associate with heroic, robust sounds? Uh, usually that's going to be brass. Uh, so welcome, welcome. We're getting some more people, it looks like. Oh, sorry, I clicked on the stream thing. Um, so if you're just joining us, basically we're just going through a basic process. I got asked a question on how to find the best instruments to play a part when orchestrating. All right, and I said the first uh, first step is to figure out what you want your primary instrument to be. Um, if you're only gonna have one instrument, that's great. If you wanna have doubling, that's cool, but you still need to start with the first instrument. And the first step is to look at the range of the part you've written. We have this little idea here. And then you're going to make a list of all the instruments that can physically play this part. A very quick, short list we came up here was violin, French horn, trombone, euphonium, clarinet, cello, and viola. And then the next step, once you've got your list, is to think about what kind of personality or emotions you're trying to convey with your music. Uh, because once you've done that, go through your list and eliminate any instruments that can't play the part, the part while delivering your desired personality or emotion. So we kind of went through this already. We said that violin probably isn't gonna be a good choice. Clarinet, I don't really personally think that would work, neither with the cello or viola. And then the euphonium, personally, I think the euphonium, which is almost like a tenor tuba, it's a cool instrument, but it depends on what kind of vibe I'm trying to get. And if this is something heroic, something a bit more robust, of our options, the French horn and trombone are the two that I would choose from. So then the last step, of course, is make a choice of the remaining options. So let's actually try this. Let's listen to both, shall we? All right, let's try, we've got a little piano idea. Let's add two tracks and let's see what it would sound like on a French horn and what it would sound like on a trombone. Welcome everybody who's just getting on. Uh, if you got any questions, throw them in the comments, people. You're being very quiet. I know it's been a long time since I streamed, but there's gotta be some questions, right? Let's see here, individual articulations. Let's just do legato techniques. Let's do horn solo one. Actually, if it's a heroic robust sound, I'm gonna want an ensemble patch. So let's do the whole horn section playing together. So we've got this idea. Why is it, there we go, click on it. That's pretty good. I like the way that sounds. Let's see what the trombones sound like though. So I'm gonna go down to Spitfire Brass Professional. This is my favorite library that I like to work with. We'll go with the Ensemble Tenor Trombone Patch. Same exact thing. And I think I like the tenor trombones. Or, uh, uh, one second. No, French horns sound way better. Welcome, Ace. Uh, thank you. Welcome, welcome. I'm glad you liked my videos. I appreciate it. 
Uh, I'm excited to start making more videos. I'm going to be doing tutorials on emotions again. So the next video I'm working on is how to portray uh, basically like wonder and amazement and awe with music. That's always a fun one. Um, and then, yeah, I'm just going to be making a bunch of like how to, how to emotion videos and how to portray different emotions. I want to try and create a little bit of an encyclopedia for people on YouTube. But thank you. Welcome to the stream. I'm glad that you found my channel helpful. All right, see here. So where are we? Look at the range part you've written. Oh, yeah. So make a choice of the remaining options. All right. So that's how you start with your find your primary instrument. So we decided on French horns or I decided on French horns because I like French horns. Um, and then from here, it's um, once you have your primary instrument, the next question comes into whether you're going to double with multiple instruments. So that's what the actual question was about. On, I got a question. I can't. I'm sorry, I should have written down who asked, but someone asked on my post on YouTube. Basically, how do you figure out how to double instruments and find something consciously? It said that lots of people have kind of an intuition for it or an instinct for it of mixing instruments, but how do you take more of a kind of deliberate approach? And this is how you're going to do it. So once you have your primary instrument, it's going to come down to uh, instruments to double your primary. It's going to come down to the type of doubling you need. Anytime you double instruments, you need to have a very clear reason why. Because when you're adding more instruments, it's going to have impact on your sound. You don't want it to get cluttered. You don't want it to sound uh, overused. You need to make sure that you have a deliberate use for the doubling instruments. And in general, there are three. Three basic ideas behind why you would want to double instruments and not just leave one section, say the four French horns playing this melodic idea together. Um, so we're say, make sure you have a clear understanding of why you are doubling. All right, so reason number one is you need the part to sound louder. All right, you need to balance the dynamics. Let's say that you've got a flute, all right, a solo flute is playing your melody and that's beautiful, it's awesome, it's wonderful, but you got a full string section in the background, all right? Now you could either get rid of some of those strings or if you like the sound, you need to double that flute with some more instruments to flesh out the dynamics, to make it stronger and stick out. In a similar idea, you need to, to balance the width of your sound all right this is a there's a wonderful book called i believe it's called orchestration timbres or textures or something like that uh by henry brandt i've got it downstairs dang it um but it's an awesome book and it talks about a concept called harmonic balance which is the idea of how you create balance between the different layers in your music how do you make sure that your melody your harmony your bass line that they all sound full they all sound effective when playing alongside each other and it doesn't sound like one idea is sticking out because it's more powerful than the others or how another idea is not being getting enough attention because it's much weaker than the rest and the idea of creating what he calls harmonic balance or creating that equally balanced concept like a weight between all of your layers comes down to a couple different things but two of the big ones are being all the layers are of equal dynamic strength and all of them are of equal width or fullness in their sound uh so we'll call that fullness all right so again saying that uh in general what henry brandt claims is that it takes about four flute timbre instruments so like flutes uh clarinets different instruments within a specific kind of timbre quality he breaks it down into like 13 groups that's a complicated book but very good read i recommend it um and it takes about four of those playing in unison to match the fullness and dynamics of any one open brass instrument. So let's say you've got a trumpet idea playing and you want to balance it with some, balance it with some woodwinds. You're going to need four woodwinds playing in unison to balance that one trumpet. So these are essentially, like I said, you want to create similar dynamics, similar size. You just want to balance the idea. The third reason why you may decide to double an instrument is you want to create a new composite sound. Adjust for weaknesses is what I'll put in parentheses. Um, so let's say that we went with the French horn and it's a great sound, um, but we just want it to be a little more lush. All right, we want it to have a bit more of a wider scope. The French horns are situated very specifically in an orchestra. Maybe you want a wider sound. So you're gonna double it with instruments that can compensate for that. 
Uh, for example, the cello section is a very common choice to give more width to your French horn sound. Um, or maybe let's do something a bit more specific. Let's say that you have a flute and the flute is playing a beautiful melody, but you just want the flute to have more of a snap, more of a pluck at the beginning of each note. So you could decide to double the flute and with violins playing pizzicato, plucking on their strings, or maybe a harp plucking on the harp. That'd be a way to give a little bit more of a pluckier quality to your melody. But the idea is you need to find out one of these three reasons. One, you're doubling to get a bigger volume. You are doubling to get a more fullness of your sound and or you are doubling just to create a new composite form because the goals you have are going to determine what instruments you have available. So let's say types of doublings. All right, we have like doublings, which is doubling instruments with other instruments of similar quality. So doubling the violins with the violas, instruments of the same section, or doubling the trumpet with the trombones. Again, they have very similar sounds. They're both brass instruments. Or in the woodwinds, maybe you're doubling the flutes with other flutes, like the piccolo, or the clarinets with other single reeds, like the bass clarinet, or in oboe with the bassoon, because they're both double reeds. They've got similar kind of qualities of their sound. Uh, these doublings, where you're pairing instruments with similar sounds already, are great for emphasizing increases in size and dynamics, all right? Then unlike doublings, often called expressive doublings, um, like doublings are often called functional doublings as well, I'll put that. So you're, you're doubling identical instruments or near identical instruments. Uh, and unlike doublings are also often called expressive doublings because these are the ideas that you are doubling instruments with very different sounds. So earlier we talked about the flute and the harp. They have very different qualities. They are played differently. They are built differently. One creates a sound by vibrating air within a metal tube. Another creates sound by vibrating a string that has been plucked. The French horn and the cellos, another great example of two unlike instruments. But because you are combining instruments of differing qualities, these are great for creating brand new and composite sound qualities or timbres. All right, so the best way to try to figure out the best kind of approach you would take to an unlike doubling is to again think about what you're lacking from your primary instrument. All of it starts with picking that prime, oops, wrong with mine, by picking that first instrument. Find the primary instrument that's gonna be responsible for your core sound and then when you're doubling, again, you have one of these two options. Are you doubling to create a bigger sound or a louder sound? Then awesome, you're gonna wanna stick to instruments that are similar. So for the French horn, we might double with the euphonium, or we might double with the muted uh, trumpets or a muted trombone uh, to get kind of the closest sound quality. Um, or if we decide that we wanted to double for a more expressive, a more interesting timbre, we could say French horns are great but we want more of a, like I said, a lush kind of bowed string quality. All right, awesome, get the celli. Uh, or maybe you decide that you want a bit more edge to the sound, cool. Maybe try doubling with a double reeded instrument like the oboes or the bassoons, both of them, which would be interesting mixes because they would give that more articulate kind of edgy quality to the French horns. It's all about your goals. Does any of this make sense? I should probably be asking that. I should check the uh, comments. Uh, Tamashi, yes, it has been a long time. Welcome. Um, let's see. Uh, no, don't see Matt or uh, Same. I don't. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen too many regulars yet. It's been the first stream in a while. But uh, Milos, welcome. Hey, how are you? Uh, uh, thank you. I say, hey, how are you? Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm doing very well. Quick question: Is it possible or doable to go with violins two above violin one in octaves, or just in a way to add subtle color? where violin ones are more energetic and have melody in the down octave. Of course. Yeah, it is. Violin ones above violin two is not a hard rule. In fact, there are no specific rules. There's no unbreakable rules. You can go with whatever you want. Uh, the violin two, if that were the option, people would ask why not just give the melody to violins two. Violin one doesn't always have to have the melody. Uh, conventionally speaking, Violin one will typically be written above violin two, but that's not necessarily the case. You don't have to. 
If there is ever a rule you have, you can always feel free to break it if it gives you the sound you like. Because at the end of the day, the number one rule of writing music is just that sound is king. If you get the sound you're looking for, then go for it. Awesome. Good for you. No one should tell you otherwise. I mean, Hans Zimmer is one of the most remarkable composers of our day and age in terms of breaking rules. All right. He does things all the time just because he likes the sound. So Interstellar, one of the most incredible soundtracks of this century so far. Um, part of that, he recorded his stringed instruments just whacking the side of their instruments with pencils. All right. Is that conventional? No, but it gave him the sound he liked. And so other things you could do, you could, uh, there are some rules that say never have the clarinet play higher than the flute. Uh, but if it gives you the sound that you want, go for it. There are no rules in music. It's more so guidelines. And so the only hard rule is that sound is king. If it gives you the sound that you like, go for it. Awesome. That's the choice you should be making. Hope that makes. Um, and Tamashi asks, where are you right now? New studio? Are you in Detroit? I am not in Detroit. Good guess, though. Um, I, for obvious reasons, I'm not going to say where I am other than I'm in Michigan. All right, I did move recently, so it is a new studio. Uh, I'm in a new city. I'm very excited to be in a new city. Uh, I love being where I was, but it was time to move on, and I'm glad to be where I am now. Uh, but like I said, I'm not going to say exactly where I am for hopefully understandable reasons. But yeah, still in Michigan. I love my home state of Michigan. Let's see here. So where were we? Types of doublings. Oh yeah, unlike in doublings. So the last thing we'll talk about with doublings is the final choice. Uh, we'll say options for doublings. I'm going to be unison or octaves slash intervals. All right, so this is again a kind of an option that you want. Unison is do you want your doublings to play the same exact notes? So if the French horn and cello are playing the same exact notes, uh, they're not split in octaves or anything, that tends to work really well. Work really well. Well, for blending sounds into a new timbre. All right, when you force two different instruments, two different qualities to play on top of each other like that, then it's going to help force them to blend a little bit more. So that's very useful for light, unlike doublings. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can only use it for unlike doublings, because of course this will result in a louder quality too, since you're playing the same part. Uh, it just depends on the type of effect you're looking for. Octaves slash intervals work well for taking up, up more space and creating a louder sound slash presence. Again, it's not your only option. It's not like if you want to create like doublings, you're gonna work with octaves and intervals. Um, oh, and only octaves or intervals. It depends on what goal you're looking for. Basically, once you found your primary instrument and once you found your secondary instrument, you wanna consider, is it better to have them play in unison? If it is, awesome. If that's the goal you're looking for, you want a narrower sound, but you want them to blend better, sweet. Um, sometimes that's not feasible, sometimes you just have instruments that are played two vastly different ranges, so it's not going to work well. Um, but sometimes octaves and intervals, you do it just because, like I said, you want to create bigger space. You want to take up more space. Sometimes you want to create, uh, it's a matter of just kind of convenience. Uh, for example, if you were combining the oboe with the French horns, you might have different ranges depending on your goals of the instruments. Uh, combining the flute with, say, pizzicato viola would also be something that would be interesting. Um, it just depends on what kind of issues you would run into and what your goals are. So all of this to say, all of this to be kind of a kind of mush, hectic kind of lesson. If you want to pick your instrument, the best way to start is by picking your primary instrument. Start by looking at the part you have written. We came up with this little ditty here. All right, so find the part that you've written, look at the range, and make a list of all the instruments that can physically play the part. We had a much longer list here earlier because then once you have your physical your list of all your options, you then carefully consider what personality and what emotion do you want to convey with this little idea. We decided we wanted a bit more of a heroic kind of idea. So we eliminated all the instruments that I thought would not fit that. So you want to look at it, 
the part what which instruments can physically play the part while at the same time delivering the kind of emotion you want so for example sure the trumpet can physically play this part but it would be on the very bottom edge of the trumpet's range where the trumpet doesn't necessarily sound bright and heroic so while it physically could play the part it's not going to be the best choice so eliminate it from the list until you have a short list of which instruments can physically play the part and can deliver the emotion or personality you're looking for so that from that short list you can just choose whichever one you like the best that's really as easy as it is as it is uh orchestration there's this mysterious quality of instruments that whatever instrument you pick as long as it can play it physically and deliver the personality you want whatever one you go with is going to sound indispensable it's going to sound like this was the best choice you could have chosen um just because it fits all right so as long as you get that you're good you got your first choice then if you want to double or need to double Again, you want to start by being clear about your reasons. Is this a matter of increasing the size? Is it a matter of increasing dynamics? Is it a matter of creating a brand new kind of composite sound or adjusting for weaknesses in your primary instrument? Like we talked about earlier, maybe you have the flutes playing the melody, but they don't have a plucky enough attack. So you want to address that. So once you've figured out what you need to do and why you're doubling, you start visiting the types of doublings. All right, do you want a like doubling or also known as a functional doubling, which you double instruments of very similar sounds. So either double a flute with more flutes or double it with a piccolo or maybe double the violin one with second violins as Milos was saying. Um, you pick instruments that are similar in quality to each other because those doublings won't result in a new strange complex timbre, but they will result in greater size and greater dynamics. And then Sometimes you want to go with an unlike doubling or an expressive doubling where you deliberately pick instruments with different timbre qualities. And so like the French horns and the celli or flute and harp, as we said earlier. And the reason for this would, again, specifically be you want to find out what your primary sound is lacking. What are you missing? What do you want to add to it? And then, again, go through the same exact process you did up here. Start by all the instruments that can physically give it. So if you wanted, say, flutes, again, and you wanted a pluckier attack, all the instruments that could do it, any stringed instrument played pizzicato, technically the piano could do it, the harp can do it, mandolin, guitar, any of those instruments are great. Um, all kinds of instrument choices you'd have. And then you would go through, all right, what quality do you want? What emotion are you going for? Which one is the most needed? If you want something that's subtle and just gives a little pluck, the harp's probably the best choice. It's another solo instrument, it's quiet, it won't take up a lot of attention, but it will give that little plucky quality that you were looking for. And then of course the last one is choosing between doubling in unison or doubling in octaves and intervals. This one is up to you and what you like. Sometimes it just comes down to convenience and writing for the instruments properly in good registers, but sometimes you do get to choose. Do you want to create more blend or do you want to create take up more space? So awesome, hopefully that helps. Oh, let's see. Uh, Tomashi didn't ask for GPS location, and thanks for the compliment. Uh, what do you like about Michigan that any other state? I'm from India, so I don't know. Good question. Okay, okay. I love Michigan, all right? And Michigan gets a bad rap from people. I don't know why. But the, I think what I love about Michigan is just the sheer variety and just the beautiful nature. We've got, we're surrounded by most of the Great Lakes. Lake Michigan is breathtaking. We've got sand dunes. We've got mountains in the UP. Small mountains, but they're mountains. Forests, big cities. We've got everything. It's it's an adventurous state. I love it here so much. And the people are just kind. The Midwest in the United States, the Midwest uh, region is what it's called. Even though we're technically not in the West, it's from earlier uh, years of the country when we weren't expanded from Atlantic to Pacific. Uh, the Midwest has just a reputation for being very friendly people. And uh, I love it. I grew up here, and I've got a friend who said two things. He said that the, there are only two types of people who don't like Michigan. It's the people who have never been here or the people who were born here and have never left, so they never realized how good we have it. And I've traveled quite a bit, which I'm very grateful for, and I love Michigan so much. Um, so, yeah, awesome. Um, a fun question. Thank you, Tamashi. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, do you like long melodies or short melodies, like long flowing melody or short lent motifs? I don't really have a preference. It depends on the project. I've had projects where it made the most sense to write a short motif that would come back again and again for the characters. 
And I've had uh, projects, sometimes the same project, where another character, it made sense to have a long lyrical melody. I tend to default to eight bar melodies. That's just how I sketch. I start with the melody, I write for eight measures, and then from there I develop it as needed. Sometimes I'll make a shorter kind of version, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and sometimes I'll make it longer in a full piece. Uh, and nice shirt. Did you watch Naruto or Boruto? Boruto has a new manga. If yes, what songs or themes do you like? I love, I grew up watching Naruto, so thank you. Yes, represent. Uh, love Naruto. Don't watch Boruto. Nothing against it. Just never got into it. Um, I don't know if I have favorite songs, but I have so many favorite OSTs that I enjoy. Uh, Screaming God Narukami is really good from Naruto Shippuden. And of course, I love Jiraiya's theme from Naruto. Uh, say, and, sorry for sidetracking. No worries. Uh, uh, all right. Awesome. Thank you, Andy, for stopping by. Oh, yeah. And the review will be available later. Oh, uh, yeah. So the, all, all, all the videos, recordings, all, every live stream gets recorded and posted to YouTube. You can come back then. Uh, Milo, any tips on how to achieve balanced DVC string sounds? I mean, an only string composition where I'm afraid of imbalance of one section to the other. Um, my best advice is to uh, just, if you're gonna use Divisi, just be aware of trying to use Divisi in the other instruments. So if, if you're gonna use, how do I put this? Cause this is kind of a, it can be a complicated or simple answer. Here's how I'll put it. If you are going to split violin one into Divisi, it probably should not be playing any melodic material if they're the only section being split. All right, so uh, remember, for those of you who don't know, Divisi means to split the section in half or in thirds or however many you'd split it into, and then divide the parts amongst those parts. So if you have eight first violins, and then say six second violins, six violas, six celli, and four basses. Uh, if that's what you're going with, so then you split the first violins so that they can play two parts, you've now got half the instruments playing. Um, and it doesn't necessarily come with a decrease in dynamics, but it will come with a decrease in fullness. You'll notice that it's not as many players. So if you're going to have DVC on only a few, those few sections probably should be playing accompanimental material, chords, rhythms, counter melodies, things like that. Your melody, your most important line should always have a nice, clear and strong voice. That's what I would say. Don't worry about it other than that. But as long as your melody voice has a nice, clear, strong sound that is at the very minimum comparable to all the others, then you're good. All right. Preferably the melody is a bit stronger than the others. But as long as it's not weaker than the others, you're good. Um, uh, let's see here. Do you say, stay true to your word? Okay. Uh, Tamashi, answer carefully. Do you stay true to your word? Not sure what you mean. Uh, is that a Naruto reference? I'm not sure. Uh, I always watched in the in the uh, sub, so I'm not sure if there are any kind of dub references or anything. But uh, awesome. I would say... Um, yeah, awesome. So, no, so it's not a reference. Um, no, I, I typically stay true to my word, I'd say. Um, so yeah, clarify that in the comments, Tamashi. I'll be happy to answer. But here, so next question that I had was the idea of using intervals and emotions for writing ideas. All right, so one of the very first, one of the very first videos I ever did on YouTube was a video called like, musical intervals and emotions or something like that. It's one of my most popular videos. More popular, I should say most, but more popular videos. And the idea is, it's a very simple concept, that certain intervals have certain connotations. So like the minor second. Let's switch to piano, shall we? The minor second, it's the very famous Jaws interval, right? It's very ominous, very kind of threatening. But then on the other hand, we have something like the minor sixth interval, which is very famous from Star Wars and the Force theme and Leia's theme. It's a very kind of uh, sad, heavy, emotional interval. And I'm not going to go through all of them right now. If you want to check out my video on inter uh, intervals and emotions, it's a very old video. I think it's like four years old at this point. Um, but the question I got was awesome. All right, cool. We've got intervals, but how do we actually apply this to writing music? Is it applicable to writing music? And in general, I'd say it's not something you want to focus 
too much on, right? You don't want to get bogged down on specific, like, well, if I'm, are you, specifically the question asked, do you ask interval by interval? Of course not, all right? No, 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 don't worry about that. You're not gonna try to find like, okay, my first interval is, all right, so then I've got that as my first interval. Then I wanna go down a minor third. No, it wouldn't really work. Uh, so you don't wanna get bogged down on interval by interval by interval. Instead, there are three useful strategies I can recommend for applying this. Let's say three useful strategies for uh, using interval associations. All right, so the first one is to use in, in, uh, an interval or two for uh, what I like to call timbre-based motifs. All right, see, so Tamashi, more questions. Uh, you have chosen yes, congrats on your 19, you are 1,000. Oh, thank you, yes. Uh, congratulations uh, for 19,000. Yes, I am very close to 20,000. Thank you, Tamashi. Uh, you said that you will release a cover when you reach... Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. what did I say? Well, I said I would release a cup. When did I say I would release a cover? Do you have when you reach 20 K? When did I say? Okay, so if you can tell me where I said that, Tomashi, I'll hold to my word. But did I say I'd release a cover of what? Like singing? Like an instrumental cover? I'm not sure. Oh, um, yeah, let me know. What is that? I've done over 230 videos, so I've said a lot of stuff on this channel. But, um,. Let's talk about inner, uh, timbre based motifs. All right, so timbre based motifs are motifs that, uh, let's probably define this real quick. Timbre most based motifs focus primarily on, a, uh, on intervals and instrumentation to create a motif. Rhythm playing a lesser role. All right, so typically most motifs, most melodic motifs, are what we call pitch and rhythm motifs. This idea where you combine both pitch and rhythm as the primary building blocks for writing an idea. So if we were to go, that's a pitch rhythm motif. All right, that's the Hobbit's theme from uh, Lord of the Rings. You're using both pitch and rhythm to create a sense of identity. However, a timbre-based motif uses something like a specific interval and an instrumentation and its playing uh, style. So for example, that's another motif. It's a minor third played on French horns that gets louder and then quieter. That's the famous Batman motif from Hans Zimmer's Batman trilogy. All right, where he doesn't use rhythm. There's not like, there's not this idea like, There's not like this idea of multiple pitches and multiple rhythms. It's just one or two, one or two intervals are all that's needed with an interesting way of playing them. It's called a timbre based motif. So one of the cool things you can do with these intervals is you can say, all right, awesome. I really like the idea of the minor sixth. So you come back down you just focus on that one interval. Or maybe you just add one or two. And maybe that's what you like to work with. Uh, so that would be the first one. I would say use an interval or two for timbre based motif. All right, pick one or two intervals that you really like, that you just really like the way they sound played together and then find an interesting way to play them. For example, you could do the opposite. We start loud and then get quiet. Um, you can do all kinds of things with it, but the idea of a timbre based motif is pick one or two intervals you like and just find an interesting way to play them. You're great, and then you can build a theme from that. The same way you would with a regular motif, or I should say a pitch and rhythm motif. Is this making sense? Isma, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, let's see, you said you will keep it when you. So, uh, Tamashi, I have the clip of the live stream saved on my desktop. If you want proof, say yes, and I will email it to you. Go for it. Now, well, I mean, no, I believe you. I believe you. No need to email me. Uh, what is the, uh, what, so what, what kind of cover did I say I would release at 20,000? Was it like an orchestral cover? Was it a singing cover? What was it? Let, let me know. Cause I have no memory of this. Uh, but welcome Isma. Welcome. Uh, right now, 
uh, we are doing kind of two things. Right now, uh, I'm discussing the idea of how to use intervals and their associated emotions from a very old video I did. Uh, and someone asked me to basically expand on it and talk about strategies for using those associations uh, to build uh, motivic ideas or just melodies. And then Tamashi over here is reminding me of apparently something I said that at 20,000 subscribers, which I am almost approaching, I would do a cover. I'm not sure what kind of cover though. Yeah, Tamashi, what kind of cover? Is this like a singing cover? Do I have to like reveal? Because I know, I remember there was a time where people wanted to hear me sing something because technically at Berkeley, my instrument was, uh, the instrument I used to get into Berkeley was my singing voice. So uh, my, I applied to Berkeley with uh, as a singing major because you can't do composing. And then I got in from that, but it's been a long time since I did any like dedicated singing practice. But I am a man of my word. I'd stick to it. Uh, let's see here. So we talked about tamper-based motifs. Awesome. So the next interval, the next strategy that I talked about uh, that I want to bring up is the idea of using intervals to shape a basic melody. So some of you know that I have a general strategy um, where I will start with a chord progression. All right, so let's just say, we'll say A minor, then we'll say D major because that's, I'm a sucker for that sound. Oops, that's French horns. Let's go to the piano. One of my favorite chord combinations. Uh, and then we'll say, we'll do, uh, let's do F major. And then we'll do E minor. So we just got a decent idea. All right, so then some way that you could try to create a melody on top of this is to simply use for what is called a target tone. Target tones are important notes in a melody that are usually taken from the underlying chords. So what we could just do is say, all right, let's just pick some notes from underneath. So let's say C and E work well. Then we'll say F sharp and D. And then we'll do F natural, C, and then E and B. So then we've got a very basic melody. Let's see. Actually, let's just, I'm a terrible piano player. So let's just play this. And I've got, oh, I've got a very tiny keyboard on my desk right now too, so. All right, so we've got a basic idea. This is called a, tar this is basically like a structure for your melody. These are target tones. So then we would just go through and we would just find ways to embellish it. So let's say we could do, we want to do it a little bit more stepwise motion. And then we'll do a leap. And so we've got a nice motif here. And then we can just create some new ideas. And this is a very simple kind of approach to creating melodies. And so the basic principle is just this idea that you have the chords underneath and you start with your target tones, which are those notes taken directly from the chords. And then you just find ways to embellish it. You play around with it. You can improvise if that's what you like to do and find a way to make it turn into a melody that you like. So the way you can do this without chords and you can just use the intervals, we can still go with that basic idea. Start with a couple intervals you like. So let's say I like the a mi uh, that minor sixth. All right, then ignore this interval. Let's just find another one we like. Let's do G and let's go down to D or right, a perfect fourth. So we've got... So I've got an interval that I like. I've got this sense of longing. I have a way of just coming back down with a perfect fourth, which is a fairly neutral concept. And then our uh, interval. And then let's say I want to create something even more dramatic. So we'll do um, E to C. We'll do, um, well, that'd be another minor sixth. So let's just do another minor sixth. And it's, that's another way that you can use these intervals to create something, um, is use interesting intervals to flesh out the target tones 
of your melody. All right, so you could use this as a way to kind of use the same strategy I talked about. Create with initial tones and then we'll say that's tritone, so let's do a G. And then you can just find a way to embellish this without a chord progression. I tend to default to dotted rhythms for some reason. And we can just embellish it a bit, find something that works. That sounds like a decent idea, so let's flesh that out. And of course, it's just a very basic idea. But is, is all of this making sense? Anyone have any questions so far? I should be asking that more often. Um, <laughs> Tamashi, sorry for single-handedly bullying you into singing, but your main instrument in Berkeley was voice and you are a trained singer, a piano track or guitar and you singing. And I'm the one who asked you to sing. Oh, awesome. So you were the one. I do remember that. Uh, oh, you also sing very well. So you want to hear my voice. Any genre works. All right. Um, awesome. Actually, you know what, Tamashi? I might make a post about that. Uh, send me that clip that you said you saved. Uh, I'll see. I'll I'll think about because I uh, we'll see. We'll see. I, I I will. I can't say it's gonna happen anytime soon. But if I said I'm gonna do a cover and do a singing voice reveal, then I'll do it. All right. Um. Welcome, Matt. Welcome. Um. Awesome. So yeah, we got some regulars showing up. So so far, what we're talking about between me getting bullied into singing by Tamashi, uh, we've got um. Yeah, two strategies. We use an inter uh, we're learning how to use specific intervals to create. Um, like, well, uh, uh, I'm sorry. One second. Let me grab a drink real quick. I've got my Star Wars mug. I'm checking my roommate's Star Wars mug. But uh, let's see. Um, yeah, so right now, the question I received was sent to me again on YouTube from the post I made on YouTube. And I was asked about my video. One of my very first videos where I listed a list of intervals and their commonly associated emotions. And the question was basically, this is cool information, but is there a way to actually practically apply this? So we've covered two already. We talked about the use of timbre-based motifs, about finding an interval or two that you like and just finding a cool way to play them with instruments. We talked about using these intervals to create a interesting, like a, a target tone map for your melody. And the most important notes in your melody, a skeleton that you can build and embellish on. And the third strategy we're gonna talk about is using, oops, use interesting intervals to create a chord progression. All right, so once again, I'll, I'll make it a bit bigger. One of my favorite ways to, one of my favorite intervals is this major sixth or minor sixth so let's do so if you find out that you just really like this interval then there are a lot of different things you can do you can try to find different chords that contain the chords so we could say maybe f major to a minor Do that and of course some people might point out that this is not proper voice leading to which i will point out cool but voice leading while useful is technically just a suggestion it's not necessary in every genre um in particular cinematic movie uh, music film track uh, soundtracks video game soundtracks things like that often negate uh will ignore common voice uh leading if it gives them the sound that they like and so if i like this sound Awesome, go for it. Voice leading is not a law. Um, another one that we could do if we'd like this minor sixth is I could say, let's see, let's just do, let's do C major. And then let's just do to D minor. Which again, terrible voice leading. But might give you the kind of effect that you're looking for. Or if you wanted to, we could of course always actually play it with voice led which this technically would not be voice led properly let me bring this up which would kind of negate 
the whole kind of effect that we were looking for. But that's fine too. It doesn't have to, just because you start with an idea, just because you like the idea of using a minor sixth, doesn't mean that you should stick to that constantly. If you can always use inspiration as a springboard. If you started out thinking, I like this idea, but along the way, while using and experimenting with that idea, you came across this idea, which you liked better, or maybe you could do a major instead of a minor. If you like that better, cool, don't limit yourself to your first idea. Does that make sense? Any questions? People are being a little quiet. I hope, like, does all this make sense? Does all this make sense? Um, Cause those are my three strategies. I can't remember who asked. I apologize. I should have written people's names down, but I hope that's helpful. We've got a few more minutes here and I have one more question that I had prepared. I will answer this question. And then if anyone has any questions other than Tamashi wanting to hear me sing, uh, we can do, uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer those two. But for now, I've only got one more uh, prepared. All right. So the last question I received was about, this one came on Instagram. And the question was about combining a rock band with traditional orchestra. Um, one second, I think someone's here. I thought I heard someone. Did you guys hear that? I'm supposed to be the only person in the house. Um, but let's see here. So using rock instruments with the orchestra. Um, so uh, the question was specifically about the soundtrack to Spider-Verse, uh, Daniel Pemberton's soundtrack to Across the Spider-Verse. So the question I received, like I said, was about combining rock instruments with traditional orchestral instruments. For this, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. It's very common to use the kind of combine additional instruments from outside the orchestra with the traditional orchestra as a way to increase size or increase scope or volume. Uh, so, for example, Hiroyuki Sawano does this all the time with Jack and Titan. You start with a regular orchestra, and then if you need to fill it out, you can do things like add a choir to the mix, or you can add a rock band, which he does, or you can add a pipe organ or synthesizers or all of the above. Anything that you add to the original kind of bass orchestral sound and template is going to have an impact on kind of creating a wider, larger scale sound, if that makes sense. So specifically, I was asked about using rock instruments with the orchestra, because I think I've already done a video on using kind of synths with the mix. Um, but for this, there are essentially three instruments we're gonna focus on. So three basic instruments uh, for getting the hybrid rock sound. All right, the first one is the drum kit. All right, this is very important because it's a very it's a very different approach to using a drum set than it is using traditional orchestral percussion instruments. And you're gonna have specific roles that each instrument plays, and we'll talk about these in a bit. The next one is the electric guitar. The third one is the bass guitar. And each of these are gonna have pretty simple roles that they're gonna play as a bass, all right? And this is where you can kind of use these default settings if you are not yourself an electric guitar player or a bass guitar player or drum set percussionist. If you don't play any of these instruments but you still want to use them in arrangement, there are specific roles you can use. Um, and they all start with the drum kit. So the drum kit, the general basic drum kit is going to have three basic components. There are more, but three basic ones, right? So we have the snare drum. We have, I'm going to highlight this so I don't have to keep spacing. We have the kick slash bass drum. And then we have the hi-hat slash ride cymbal. And then of course, if you want, you can also do toms. And each of these actually plays a very specific role. So the hi-hat, and ride cymbals are what we're going to call timekeepers. All right, they are going to keep a constant, keep a constant eighth or sixteenth note pulse. 
All right, so let's try to picking this out. So this is used, it's called a timekeeper because these are used to help keep time for all the other players in a band. The rhythm section of a band, being like the rhythm, uh, rhythm guitar, keyboards, drum set, and bass guitar, if I didn't say that already. Uh, their main job is helping the rest of the band stick together. All right, almost like a metronome, an embellished metronome. And part of what the drum kit does is it uses the hi-hat or ride cymbal in some cases to do just that, to keep a constant pulse. Sometimes you can embellish it a little bit, but if you're not a percussionist, you want to at least get started by using only eighth or 16th notes, then branch forward. And we'll, we'll, we'll create a beat uh, in a minute. Uh, but let's talk about the others first. Next we have the snare drum, which is known as the, it keeps the back beat or it emphasizes the weak beats of your tip of your time signature. All right, so the snare drum and the hi-hat combined are the timekeepers, essentially. Their whole job, their main job, is just helping the rest of the band keep tempo. They're basically glorified metronomes. Again, you can embellish if you are a percussionist and you know how to play, go for it. But for the most part, stick to these until you've got some practice. Then the bass drum is where we get the personality. All right, so it will do two things. Mark the strong beats and fill out the groove. So if you're gonna have a unique rhythmic identity, it's going to be from this, the kick or bass drum. And then, uh, again, we'll go into this a bit more, but then the toms are used as filler, for the most part. There are a lot of other things they can do, but for now, all we're gonna focus on, they're added for embellishments. Uh, useful for embellishments. So let's actually build a beat together, shall we? So I've got a drum kit sound library loaded. I don't know this one very well. I have I don't use a lot of drum kits in my music. But this is Garage Kit Light Studio Drummer um from Native Instruments I believe. Yep. So let's pull this up so it looks like let's open up a MIDI thing. So we're going to start with our hi-hat. Let's find where the hi-hat is, all right? Now there's a button here somewhere, isn't there? Um, I don't see it. All right, so let's just open the drum kit again. Then open it. So what? Well, let's see. I look. I'm seeing some questions out of my peripherals. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Tomashi, I can choose. You are still. You are bound and determined to get me to sing this, Tomashi. I will choose the song. No worries. I if I have to pick one, I'll pick a song. Uh, but Tomashi, I have a question. Have you seen the image of Ryan Leach's composing competition? If yes, then what do you? Uh, what uh, what about its emotion is pretty unclear and okay so what do I think about it um, and its emotion is pretty unclear and open to interpretation I'm not sure uh, I have not seen it and we'll figure uh, but I'll take a look at it if we got time and Matt dares me to write a MIDI drum fill oh man I don't use drums that often but I'll try it let's do it all right so I'm gonna pull this over here to my other screen so I can follow along so let's see I am looking for the hi-hat where is the aha hi-hat let's see open pedal is b flat of some sort all right so we got b flat right there with and, and cubase is a sharp so all we're going to do we're going to set this we'll do an eight bar rhythm shall we and we're just going to let's chop this up into eighth notes at first and see how that sounds All right, it sounds very machine gun effecty. So let's bring this down, the velocity down a little bit. We will emphasize beats one and three. In fact, let's just raise these and we'll copy and paste everything. Uh, let's delete this and we'll copy and paste. And then let's bring the top ones up just a little bit more for a little more personality. Velocity, this thing I'm manipulating down here is called velocity, and it tells Cubase basically how hard do I want it to hit each note. Then, again, to get a little more interest, let's go to my logic presets. I'm going to randomize the velocity by 6% so it sounds a bit more human. All right, so awesome. So we've got a bit more of an eighth note, a slower kind of timekeeper. That's good. So the next one we got, I said we talked about the snare drum, right? Snare drum emphasizes the back beat or the weak beats, which in 4-4 four, four time are going to be beats two and four. 
Uh, Cranny, from a scale of 1 to 10, how important do you think music theory is for a composer outside the basics, of course? Um, I don't know what I would put it at. Um, it's... I don't know how I would rate it. It would be important... It's very useful as a tool. It's very useful... Um, I'm sorry, I think there's someone in the house. I keep hearing some shout. They should know that I'm working right now, though, so they shouldn't bother. Um, but, yeah, on a scale from 1 to 10... How important is music theory? I think it's very useful. Music theory is incredibly useful. It's the analogy I like to use is it's like try, writing music without knowing music theory is like trying to write a poem in a language you don't know. It's perfectly possible and it's entirely possible and perfectly good if you don't want to, if you like that thrill of exploring and just going with what sounds right or what sounds natural, go for it. That's awesome, amazing, more power to you. However, if you understand the language, then suddenly options are available to you. You can get more nuanced. You can get more specific. For example, if you're a native English speaker, we all understand that content, happy, and ecstatic all have very different meanings. They're all generally kind of forms of happiness, but they have very kind of distinct nuanced meanings. And the more you know about music theory, the more deliberate you can be with the specific sounds that you want. The more you can decide, all right, I want some dissonance, Maybe I'll go with something other than say. You could decide, if you know a lot about dissonance, if you know a lot about music theory, you could say, all right, I want to create a dissonant chord. I know that set theory has these beautiful things called minor second chords. Or you could decide you want to work with something like a tritone chord instead, which is very similar. Or maybe you want something a little more kind of simple. So you're gonna use something with, say, we'll go with an E minor and an F in the bass. There are lots of tools that you can learn from music theory. So I would say it's very important to study, but don't feel like it's necessary. It's, uh, so it's important to study because it's a very useful tool. Another analogy to mix my metaphors here would be, uh, if you wanna be a woodworker, you do not have to learn about all the different tools available. But if you learn how to use an entire carpenter's shop, uh, like my cousin, my cousin is a carpenter, and he has a workshop filled with hundreds of tools. It would be useless in my hands. I could make something, but nothing nearly as beautiful as anything he can create because he understands the tools. So I wouldn't say there's a level of importance. It's up to you. In terms of usefulness, I'd say it's up there about a nine or 10. The more you learn about music theory, the more fluency you have, the more control you have over it. Uh, but music theory doesn't have to be something that you study formally. It can be something that you study kind of on the side, on your own. Uh, and just kind of find your own name for things, your own way of codifying things. Um, so let's talk about the snare drum, shall we? So we've got um, snare drum was on the backbeats. Where is the snare drum on here? Let's see here. Snare. Where are the snares? I can't find them here. Uh, that's a flam. That's a roll. There we go. So it's D. That's the flam. So we want, no, that wasn't it. Which one is it? Where is it? All right, so that would be E. There we go, it's down here. So the snare is going to be on the off beats, the weak beats. Let's lower this a little bit and then we're going to randomize it. And we'll notice that our timekeepers at this point will be. Almost done. Starting to sound like a beat, right? All right, so the next one we're gonna do is we're gonna hit the kick or the bass drum, which is where we get most of our groove or our personality for the rhythm. Where is it? Let's see here. Cowbell. I don't want cowbells. I want kick. There we go. C. No, it would be. I don't want to dampen stick. Let's see here. Uh, ah, so middle C looks like it's the open. There we go. So we're going to, once again, take this entire thing. We're going to lower this down a bit. The kick drum, its primary responsibility is to hit the strong beats, one and three and four, four time. But 
we can also bring in a little bit more personality. So if we take this, copy and paste it, we'll notice that we're hitting the important beats, but we're also adding a little bit of embellishments here with some rhythms. The bass drum is where you can get interesting with the rhythm. So it's a very basic, simple kind of idea, but you're seeing how this works. Uh, so if you follow those basic ideas, then you'll come up with a decent kind of drum beat that you can work with a kit for kind of orchestral hybrid music. Then with the electric guitar, the electric guitar, you have two basic options and these are both fairly simple, so we won't go too deep into them, but they can play rhythmic car chords or melodic ideas. That could be counter melodies, main melodies. And then the bass guitar plays the bass line, but it's also going to be very closely related. Let's say it plays the bass line, but is closely related to the kick slash bass drum. So what we've got, let me see here, let me copy and paste this again. We've got basically three types of relationships that it can have, all right? Identical rhythm, you can have a simplified rhythm, or an embellished rhythm. But the main idea is like no matter what you start with, the bass line should always start with an identical rhythm to your bass drum. They should not conflict. Then, as you go along, you can decide, all right, the bass guitar doesn't have to play all of these notes, but it'll play the important ones, the most accented ones. Or you might say, all right, it's, I'm going to start with this uh, rhythm and then I'm going to embellish it a little bit. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do with that. So, um, but yeah, so this is how I would use rock instruments with the orchestra. Um, awesome. So I hope this has been helpful. Uh, Destiny Wonder Gem. Uh, awesome, yeah, welcome, Destiny. We're almost done. Unfortunately, you made it a little bit late, but I'm glad it was helpful. I'm glad you're excited. I am live and I'm going to be going live. I should say I'll be going live every week from now on until I can start putting out more videos. I'm going to create more videos. Uh, I'm going to create like a little backlog of some videos on like emotion tutorials and how to write different, portray different things with the orchestra and film music. And once I've got a library of like three or four videos ahead of time, then I'll start releasing them once a week. But until then, I'm going to be going live every week for about, about a month or so, I'd say. Um, but awesome. So welcome, Destiny. Del welcome. Um, Granny, I hope that was helpful. And uh, let's see, Tamashi. Tamashi had a question about Ryan Leach's competition. And it has his photo and what my thoughts on it are. Ryan Leach has an awesome channel, if you haven't seen it already. All right, awesome. So it's not on his community, so it must be in a video. And unfortunately, I don't have the link to the video. But yeah, someone tag me in his post or something, and I'd be happy to talk about my own kind of impressions on it and different strategies I have for kind of figuring out what emotions are in the photo. Let's see, um, let's see. Uh, Destiny, I had a question, but I'll come around to ask it another time then. No worries, if you're still on Destiny, I can answer it now. We're just wrapping up, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions people got while I'm here. Um, but no worries, I'll be live again, so feel free to stop by later if you already left. Uh, Crandy, one more thing. What do you think about the ability to read music? I've taken interest in some courses, but got turned off when I see they rely on music sheet uh, as well as a visual indicator instead of MIDI. Um, I think you just kind of nailed it right there. Um, it depends on what you want. Music, music notation is not that difficult to get learned. Being able to perform sheet music takes a little bit more mastery, but being able to recognize pitches and rhythms aren't that bad, and there are plenty of free apps that can help. So I'd say what makes it worth learning sheet notation is are you missing out because you don't? Are there resources that you are interested in that you want to learn? Because think about it, is there a class that you saw or a video that you saw that you think could change your perspective on composing or could teach you something that you've really wanted to learn and can't find anywhere else? If yes, then what's stopping you from taking it? Is it because it uses notation? And then the question is, is that, is that barrier enough? Or do you want to learn badly enough to learn music notation and to learn that information? It's up to you. Is it necessary? No. But learning how to read notation is like learning how to read. It opens up a whole world to you. You don't need to know how to read to get through life. You don't. It makes life harder, but you don't need it. The question is, though, 
there's so many things you can learn from books. There's so many things you can get from learning how to read. So is it worth the time and effort? Uh, that's something that you have to decide for yourself and on a personal basis and what you want to know. I would say if there was something that I wanted to learn and what was stopping me was not knowing this other thing, I would want to figure that out. So for example, if I did not know how to read music, I probably would have taught myself by now or used YouTube to learn or apps to learn or something uh, because I would want to have access to as many resources as I can. But that's not passing judgment. That's not, it's all about how your time is best used and what is useful for you. Maybe you don't know how to read music right now and you are happy writing music the way you do. That's fine. That's great. Awesome. More power to you. Never feel pressure to do something just because that's the traditional way to do it or the correct way to do it. I said earlier in the stream that there are no laws in music composition. There are recommendations, but there are no hard laws. So it's up to you. Let's say, let's see here. Oh, uh, Destiny. Oh, okay. I'm a music student, songwriting and performance. Awesome. And I want to get into a music composition school once I'm graduated here. Do you have any tips for getting into composition? Um, my first recommendation is just start writing. All right. Composition programs are a little bit difficult to get into just because most music schools don't have dedicated composition programs. For example, getting into Berkeley or a, a local university, like the University of Michigan, uh, both great programs incredible composing programs but not both of them also require that you have an instrument that you audition with which is kind of stupid and hopefully that changes in the future but as of now most programs don't recognize online programs often do uh, but many programs just the most programs like in-person programs will require that you know some kind of instrument uh, if you're singing, that's awesome. That's the voice. That's how I got into Berkeley as I used my application. Uh, my application process was singing. And part of that was sight singing, which was something I had to spend about six months practicing to get decent at. And I haven't practiced at all. So I probably lost that ability. Um, but do you, so I would say just start writing music. Start writing music, start writing music, start writing music. If you want to learn more about composition right now, check out my playlists. I have playlists on harmony for composers melody for composers and arranging and orchestration check those out just get practicing because if you do try to get into a composing only program that's the biggest one can you write music are you competent with writing music so just hone your craft that's the best advice i can give you um let's see uh david parker how can i get a free pr uh, production app or do i have to pay if i want to use it such as cubase um cubase has a free option i think most uh most uh most what you're talking about is called a digital audio workstation or a DAW for short. Uh, just Google free DAWs. Um, I'll write that down. Um, so just Google Google best free DAWs. All right, Google that. You'll find something. If you're interested in notation software, MuseScore is an absolute tank. All right, MuseScore came out when I was in high school, so a little over a decade ago. Well, I was in high school a decade ago, but it was older than that, so whatever. Um, I'm dating myself now. Uh, but anywho, MuseScore has been around for a long time, and for the longest time, they were just a free app. And they were good, it was good for writing music, but recently, in the past couple of years, they have just doubled down on the quality, and they are rivaling a lot of the professional programs, and they're still free. So give them a check out if you're good with music notation. It's an awesome resource. Um, um, Matt, I would say you really need to play an instrument with sheet music to really get it to sink in. And that's, that's a valid point. It's a valid point. Everybody has their own perspective, but, uh, yeah. So thank you, Matt. Definitely. Hopefully that helps. Destiny says throw music composition auditions. Sorry, I hit it too early. Um, oh yeah. So I said, yeah, most, most schools, if you go into a physical, like brick and mortar school, the audition process will involve submitting compositions that you've written, but the biggest part of the uh, audition is auditioning with an instrument, unfortunately. Like I said, it's stupid. They shouldn't have it. If you're going to school for composition, you shouldn't have to prove competency and performance. They are very different things. I have a friend who got his PhD in piano or some kind of doctorate in piano performance from uh, a very prestigious music school. Awesome guy. And as he was reading like the, one of the early drafts of my composer book, he, uh, my book on composition, he didn't realize how much of music theory he didn't know because they're just two different skill sets. So that's kind of my soapbox why I don't think they should be required. But 
Yeah, I'd say if you want to audition, unless you're doing something like Berkeley Online, Berkeley Online or other comparable like online programs, fantastic programs don't require an audition like that where you perform. Uh, but it'd be something I would prepare for. But it sounds like you already are a decent performer if you are a uh, uh, songwriting and performance major. So that should help. Other than that, the composition part, you just need to start cranking out music. All right, crank it out because they're gonna. They're, that's all they're gonna do. They're gonna ask, send us five to seven pieces that you've written that are representative of your skill level. So get better, get better, get better. Keep practicing, keep practicing until you have a portfolio of pieces that you think you can be proud of. All right, awesome. Uh, Tomashi, I can read music, but not, I'm not very good at sight reading. Should I learn sight reading, like instant sight reading or being a composer? Not really. You don't need to. There's uh, sight, sight reading is important for performers, but for composers, as long as you can read stuff and be able to study it, you're good. Um, Destiny, oh great, I've been looking at Berkeley. Awesome. Yeah, Berkeley's got an awesome program, insanely expensive, which is why I unfortunately never graduated. Um, but yeah, the audition process, audition with Berkeley... Yeah, you've got, go to Berkeley's auditions. They have the stuff on their website, which is great. If you're auditioning for Berkeley, they have the audition material. All right. They won't tell you specifically what it is, but for like sight singing, they told us, uh, for like singing, they said, all right, prepare a piece. So I sang Quizás, Quizás, Quizás by Andrea Bocelli. Uh, that was my audition song. I sang that. And then afterwards I got sent to another thing because I did a digital one. I got sent to another Zoom room where they, as part of the singing application, they would play, they did two things. They gave me sheet music and told me to sing it and be pitch correct. I had to be relative pitch. I didn't have to have like perfect pitch, but I had to be able to get the intervals right. And so I would do one and then they'd give me another one and they would get increasingly more and more difficult to see how far I could go before I started making mistakes. Then they had me do rhythm where they would give me a rhythm. They would play a rhythm and then I had to play it back with clapping or singing or something. Um, and then the last one that I remember, it was improvisation. So they played a groove or a beat track or a rhythm section, and they told me to improvise singing on top of it. I didn't need to do lyrics, but I had to improvise a melody and structure. And they've got all of that material, like the improvising tracks and stuff, all of that is available on their website. So look up a Berkeley audition process. They'll have all that stuff. And so you can practice ahead of time. I really recommend you practice ahead of time. Uh, it's gonna be very important. Um, awesome, you write electronic indie music at the moment, so you have experience with writing songs. Awesome, yeah, and the videos have been amazing with getting into composition. Thank you, I'm so glad they've been helpful. And you've really enjoyed them. Awesome, thank you, I'm really glad, that's why I do this. I love helping people. I have a bit of a chip on my shoulder about music education, and I have a really, because, like I said, I, had, I never graduated because I couldn't afford it. So I've got a chip on my shoulder about how expensive it is, and I'm doing something about that with this YouTube channel. I'm trying to get more information out there, but I've got another project coming out. Um, before by Christmas time, I'm hoping to get it out by Christmas time, but keep an eye out for that. That I won't say anything else yet. Um, search Ryan Leach composition competition first video from Tamashi. Let's see here. Let's go back, and this will be the last question I answer. Uh, just because I do need to get going. Um, let's see here. I'm I'm not seeing this. Okay, Ryan Leach Leach composition competition. All right, so. Ah, it's this one. All right, so that looks like it. Yeah, so that's the one. So a fall picture. So the, my best way that I would say about figuring out the emotions behind this is to put yourself in that situation, all right? This is gonna sound weird, but bear with me. This is a method I teach in my emotions and music portrayal class is using your five senses to explore an emotional experience. All right, sit down. If you have to go somewhere cold or put a box fan on you, that's fine. Do something to kind of sit in the experience of this picture and try to imagine what it's like to be in an autumnal setting by this. If you don't, if you've never been, if you've never been somewhere like Michigan during the fall or the autumn, it, depending on what you call it, um, then it might take a bit of an imagination. That's fine. Allow yourself the imagination. Go on YouTube, Google uh, autumn drone walks all right and just find yeah like right here a bunch of video footage of like foliage during the autumnal months and try to spend some time thinking about it and explore your five senses what do you see what do you smell what do you feel what do you hear all kinds of things uh take as many detailed notes as you can and look for ways that different things you write down or record yourself saying look for inspiration in your music that way um, I think I've done some stuff about this. 
Uh, I, I, I swear I've done a video about this. I know it's in my class. Um, I did a master class version of my class too, where I talked about this in great detail. Uh, but yeah, basically start out, use your five senses, explore it, write down a couple ideas for each one that you really like, that you just think really helps define the experience of sitting there, of being in that location. And then just start going one at a time, right? Think tempo, right? How can tempo be used to describe these things? How can your chords be used? How can your melody, how can your rhythm go through each of the different kind of nine parameters of music that I've talked about on my channel a couple of times um, and use that to explore different ideas, different gestures is what they're called, musical me metaphors for it. Uh, that's what I would go for. Uh, if you want to learn more, check out my live stream. I've got an old live stream recording about the nine parameters method. Check it out. It'll give you a bit more of an idea of what I'm talking about. But the best way to do this is to just spend as much time trying to describe what it would be like to be in that painting or that picture, whatever you want to call it, yourself, and bring that into an actual experience. That's all music is. To write a character of theme, you start by learning how to describe the character. To write an emotional theme, you learn how to describe that emotion and you find ways that your music can just bring that description to life. Make sense? That was a very quick uh, portrayal, uh, explanation, but hopefully it helps. Uh, what's that, and a person with a garden hoe or uncle by, or uncle by the arts? Awesome, so if there's a story, go for that too. It's the same thing. Place yourself in the story and try to explore it, describe it, and look for ways that those descriptions can be used to inspire your emotion, or like your music, not emotion. Uh, yeah, or emotions, all that kind of stuff. Like I said, the trick to portraying anything with music is to take the time to study it and explore it. Hopefully that helps. If I'd had a bit more time, I would have gone more in depth, but I am running behind schedule and some stuff, so I am gonna have to let you guys go. Um, thank you everyone, I'm glad you all stopped by. It was really fun to do this. I will be doing another one next week. So if you have more questions, send them my way. Either email me or message me on Instagram or comment on this video, whatever. Let me know and I'll make sure to have some prepared answers for the next stream. But until next time, guys, I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.